The 1995 production of Pride and Prejudice had a huge impact worldwide. Its modern pace and contemporary delivery succeeded in making costume drama accessible to television audiences in a manner few other productions had achieved before. The success of Pride and Prejudice also inspired a new approach to historical dramas, with the traditional stagey productions being left behind in favour of the more pacey, modern interpretations that obviously appealed to today's audiences. This interpretation isn't compromised by the trends of the current day, and consequently, Pride and Prejudice still has a timeless, legitimate and authentic feel to it. To celebrate this unique production, we take a look back at the making of the show with key members of the cast and crew and discuss the impact and continuing influence of this remarkable show. The reason I decided I wanted to do Pride and Prejudice, I went to a, a screening of um, Northanger Abbey and I sat next to Andrew Davis, who um, he, he'd actually been my English tutor at college. And I said, what I really, really am passionate about doing is a production of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, but I really want to, to do it, in, not in a, a new modern version, I just want to bring out what I really think the book is about, which I, I never felt had been brought out in the balance that it should have been. And I said to him, uh, which might have been a mistake, I said, of course, it's all about sex and money. Um, and he said, well, it's my favourite book too. So we actually shook hands on it and we said, OK, well, let's do it. It wasn't quite as easy as that because we actually, it took nine years from saying that to actually getting it on the screen. I think people think that we've done uh, an updated version, but what I would say we've done is actually gone back to the book and really, really looked at what Jane Austen was doing. And if you look at Elizabeth's character, every single word that describes her is an energetic word. She always dashes into rooms or runs upstairs or leaps over stiles or climbs or... Um, Everything about her is full of life and energy, and that's why we did uh, the production the, the way we did. We wanted to bring out what we thought was truly uh, Jane Austen's characteristics of Elizabeth. Also the adaptation by Andrew Davis, uh, he stuck to Jane Austen's dialogue. He, there's hardly a line that's different. And, and uh, Jane Austen did, did have a great sense of theater, and she wrote very good lines, although that's not easy to say. Uh, but they did cast a, a team of people who, who were able to do it. I suppose right from the start, I thought that Colin Firth would be perfect casting for Darcy. He was doing a show in Ireland, a film, and he'd had to put on a lot of weight and dye his hair blonde and got a moustache. And he'd got this very long, terrible overcoat on, and he did look pretty awful. And uh, the director said to me afterwards, we can't cast him, he looks like an unmade bed. <laughs> And various other people thought he wasn't right. Uh, and then um, Colin had decided to do it, and then his brother said, but you can't play Darcy, you're not sexy. <laughs> or isn't Darcy sexy, he's supposed to be sexy. Um, so Colin did actually temporarily pull out and uh, had to put all the pressure I could on him to, to do it. We not only talked to people, but we auditioned, and then for the ones that we, who didn't have a huge track record, we actually did screen tests. I mean, we screen tested uh, Jennifer Ely, for instance, uh, actually, rather brilliantly, because she knew from meeting me that uh, we wanted a dark-haired Elizabeth, and she was rather blonde at the time. And I didn't realise this, but she dyed her eyebrows the night before dark, so that when we put the dark wig on her for the screen test, we all said, gosh, that works really well. She looks as if she's a natural brunette. I first got the job in May, I think, and we didn't start filming till June. And uh, the first thing the BBC did was very kindly teach me how to ride. So they'd uh, drive me out on lovely sunny afternoons, and I'd leave my impoverished friends who I was living with at time behind and uh, go off to lovely fields in the countryside and be taught how to ride. The person who put my name forward, who suggested me, was the art director, Jerry Scott. Um, and what happened after that, I don't know. Obviously, everybody agreed. But I think she suddenly went, how about Alison Steadman to play Mrs. Bennett? Um, and there we are. So thank you, Jerry. Brilliant. One of my preoccupations, actually, because I, I am a sort of warrior w beforehand, was that I was too old. I mean, I was, I hate to say, I was nearly 40 um, when I played it. So I actually had my 40th birthday. And, and I was thinking, I'm too old because Mr. Collins has really just left 
you know, one of the universities, and he's probably only 23 or 24. To get the role of Mary Bennett, I had one audition. Um, I read the book twice the day before. I literally kind of sat there for sort of about eight hours and read the novel twice. Um, underlined everything that was mentioned about Mary, every, every possible bit she was in, and, and went along and read. And uh, very, very luckily was offered the job very quickly after that. The actor who was slated to play Wickham, who I don't know if I can name, was <laughs> was given the well I think probably had withdrawn for, for uh, probably had been offered some huge feature film or something I don't know and suddenly um, the part of Mr Wickham became available and um, so I'd sort of suddenly got the leading baddie which is of course a fantastic part to play. Around about the time that I knew I was going to play Mr Bennett um, I, I was lucky enough to meet a, a, a writer called Park Honan American biographer, wrote a very good biography of Jane Austen, and when he was researching it, he said to me, uh, I met an old lady, and um, this old lady, when she was a little girl, knew an old lady, who, when she was a little girl, knew Jane Austen. Now, it may have been three generations, I think it must have been, uh, but it came back to him, down these three generations, that the person in all of her books who was most like Jane Austen in character, in personality, was not any of her heroines. It was Mr. Bennett. I was very surprised to hear this. And he said, well, if you think about it, um, what does Mr. Bennett do? He's there at the events, he participates, he enjoys the parties, he enjoys the, the balls, but he doesn't, he doesn't join in too much. He's there, observing. And that's what Jane Austen did. When we decided that we wanted Carl Davis to do the music, all the heating had gone off at the BBC and it was absolutely freezing. Everybody was in overcoats and shivering. Uh, and he came into the office and we were so cold, I thought, I can't actually uh, talk to him here. So we said, let's go to the canteen, um, which was the only place that had heating on. Uh, so we went to the canteen, which was quite full of people trying to have their meetings in the canteen, all with coats and mufflers on. And we sat down with Carl, who's completely unselfconscious when it comes to music. And he said, um, we were talking about various bits and what we might use. And he said, well, I've got this idea. And he said, uh, when Mary has to sing this song very, very badly, he said, I thought we'd do this wonderful Handel piece. Uh, very, very high it is. At which point he then burst into song very loudly, falsetto. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole canteen stopped. Everybody having their meetings and their lunches and their teas just stopped while Carl, not even realising, sang the whole of this Handel song. <laughs> I thought, yes, we really have to have Carl. <laughs> Pride and Prejudice is set in the first decade of the 19th century. And if we think about it, what was the musical life like? There was no radio, no television, no CDs. Everything had to be made live. And because there was this sort of lack of being entertained, they had to entertain each other. And so in a family of girls, people would have uh, learned different skills. You know, they would, ha they would play instruments, they would learn to sing, um, they might recite, they may do all sorts of things. They certainly danced a lot. There was one character who very distinctly in the novel, her job is to provide the music and she's, it's always really very clear that she's not very good at it and is sort of suffer, suffers doing it and is suffered with people listening. But she always has to play and she's, you know, people who are very bossy and play we want to dance, play we want to sing or sing for us, play for us. 